Gospel begins today with a teaching of Jesus about cleanliness and uncleanliness. Listen and understand. He said to the crowd, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles. And the Pharisees, as we heard, took offense at this teaching. And even Jesus' own disciples asked for a little further explanation. After all, as devout Jews, they cared about the dietary laws in the Bible. This was God's word, after all. They took the Levitical laws about ritual cleanliness and which animals could be eaten or not. They took these rules seriously. Now, it's true that the Pharisees had a reputation for sort of embellishing the law, but everyone agreed that the basic rules had been laid out in Scripture. What Jesus had to say was different. It was new. It was shocking, really, when he said that uncleanliness or defilement is not a matter of putting non-kosher food in your mouth, but what comes out of your mouth. Lies, slander, and the like. As Jesus explained to his disciples, what is unclean concerns the filth in the human heart. The first comes out in words and then later in deeds. Now, we are not offended by this teaching. Maybe a little surprised at how crudely Jesus puts it today when he observes that what you put in your mouth ends up in the toilet. He did. But we're not offended by his words. In preparation, though, for this sermon, I was reading this text, and I thought, what a powerful message for us today. If there was ever a perfect illustration handed to us of the filth in the human heart, spewing out words that incite violence, it was last weekend in Charlottesville, Virginia, as we are all aware. The national spotlight was on the vile, racist rants of the KKK neo-Nazis, white supremacist movement that ended in a killing. I heard a leader of one of these hate groups who was positively giddy with delight over the events last weekend in Charlottesville. The terror they inspired, he gloated, was exactly what they intended and hoped to see repeated in many other places throughout the United States. And I think the scariest thing is that such groups are not only on the rise, but that some people who should know better, some people who believe they themselves are not racist, nonetheless were quick to try to excuse or explain or deflect or defend such behavior. In the face of evil, we as Christians must speak out. We must condemn it. This is not something that we can be silent about. The words we swallow because we are afraid or too ashamed to utter them speak volumes. Words matter, as Jesus reminds us today. Let us be clear. One only needs to hear what these neo-Nazi groups chant to understand quite clearly what is in their hearts. Jesus says, words do matter. In fairness, <clears throat> I have to say, the Pharisees were shocked at Jesus' teaching, not because they didn't believe that words matter, because they did believe that. What shocked them was that what Jesus seemed to be saying that day was a whole new interpretation of scripture. And they were right. And he didn't even gently introduce a new way of looking at things. Jesus took a bulldozer to their theological construction, their whole understanding of what God requires for us. He challenged them to consider a radically new view that's what shocked and offended them. Jesus dismissed the whole structure of dietary laws in one sentence and put in its place a new requirement. 
that we would all search our hearts, our intentions, our deepest desires. And it's right there, after this discussion of what is clean or unclean in the eyes of God, that Jesus takes his disciples into Gentile territory, the region of Tyre and Sidon. It is there that Jesus finds himself face to face with a Canaanite woman, a pagan, and therefore an unclean person. And now it's our turn to be offended, or at least very, very confused about what Jesus says. As we heard, <clears throat> a woman throws herself at Jesus' feet and begs him to heal her daughter. And what does Jesus do? Well, first he ignored her. Then he dismissed her, saying that he had come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then he insulted her. It is not fair, he told her, to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And yes, he meant her. We cringe at these words, but the disciples didn't. It's very important to understand that it may seem odd to us, but there was nothing offensive or strange to the disciples about what Jesus said to the woman. We must understand that the only strange thing was that Jesus and his disciples were in Gentile territory in the first place. In that day, Jews and Gentiles would have avoided one another. In other words, Jesus is in the wrong neighborhood. He has no business with Gentiles, nor they with him. This is just the way it was. Better just stick to your own kind, was what everybody believed. The woman who came to Jesus is a Canaanite, a Gentile, a foreigner. Scripture itself says a Jew should have nothing to do with such a person. Ezra chapter 9. Secondly, she is a she. In that day, a Jewish woman should not dare to talk to a rabbi. She should not have even been in his line of vision. For this Canaanite woman to approach Jesus was more than a disgrace. The sin was all hers. But the fear on the disciples' part was that her uncleanliness, that is her very being, would reflect badly on Jesus. He would become unclean because of her. Everyone understood the ground rules, the deep divide between Jew and Gentile, man and woman. This woman understood the ground rules as well. It's just that she wouldn't let it stand in her way because her child is ill. And she believes that this Jewish Messiah, if he is willing to help, he can heal her. It's a desperate feeling when you are ill or in trouble. And as every parent knows, it is worse when it is your child. The woman screams, have mercy on me because she has tasted fear for her child. She has felt that knot in her stomach, that grip on her chest that makes it hard to breathe. Now Jesus has come and this woman believes that health is possible if only she can make him respond to her. And Matthew says, Jesus did not answer her at all. But she will not be silent. She continues to shout, and the disciples plead with Jesus to send her away. To this frantic mother, Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And let's take a step back, folks. Would you not have just given up at that point? He was stating the obvious. She was not of Israel. She was not a Jew. She stood outside the promises of God. This is one amazing woman we have in our gospel today. She does not leave, even after the silent treatment, even after the reminder that Jesus' ministry is to his own people. After all this, she kneels before Jesus, Lord, help me, she begs. Her cry is the anguish from a mother's heart. 
Then he says the words that really make us cringe. To this distraught mother kneeling before him, Jesus says, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Jesus says he has come for the lost sheep of Israel. These words were meant to dismiss her. They also serve to remind us that Jesus is first and foremost a Jewish Messiah. We sometimes tend to forget that. We like to think that Jesus belongs to us and that the Jews are no longer in good standing with God. Matthew reminds us that Jews stand in a special relationship with God for all times. Jesus comes first among the Jews because he is their Messiah. On the other hand, and here's the shocking news for his contemporaries, Jesus, this Jewish Messiah, is on the move. Jesus is going to declare the possibility of a new relationship to God that will take his disciples a while to wrap their arms around. You might even say we haven't completely embraced it ourselves. But Jesus is about to do something for this Canaanite, this Gentile, this dog. He is about to break down a wall that will leave his earlier brush up with the Pharisees about dietary laws in the dust. He will reach through and heal both this woman and her daughter. The turning point in our story, of course, comes when the woman who has just been told it's not fair to throw the children's food to the dogs is quick-witted enough to say, yes, Lord. Yet, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Truly, truly an amazing woman. You sense that Jesus is impressed. Woman, great is your faith. I think he must have been delighted with her. She provided the opening for him. She gave evidence of such urgent, deep faith that he could, on that day, begin to crack the walls of prejudice and discrimination. The division between Jew and Gentile, male and female. Now later, of course, Jesus could be more specific and direct. He would tell his disciples after the resurrection that their task was to go to all nations. Jesus would no longer be the Messiah to the Jewish nation. He would be the Lord of life for all people everywhere. And this brings our gospel home to us today. We don't use words like clean and unclean to divide people, but divide them we still do. We offer other words like respectable or worthy and unworthy to decide whether we will live near them, receive them into our communities, break bread with them, or help them in any way. Jesus tells us today, be careful about these categories you create to divide people into those you find acceptable and those you don't. The insiders and the outsiders, your words reveal your heart and guide your actions. This is also why it's so important that we in the church, and I have to say this, especially the Lutheran church, speak out clearly against fascism. It's amazing to me that I have to even say these words, but that we speak out against in our own time. While we are so proud of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the other wonderful martyrs and heroes of the Lutheran tradition who spoke boldly against the Third Reich in Germany, it's also true that many, many Lutherans chose to be silent or worse, buy into Nazism. The hatred of Jews or blacks, or for that matter, the hatred of any people because of their religion, or their ethnicity, or race, or sex, is a direct contradiction to the Christian gospel. We all know it's been hard for the church throughout the centuries to fully grasp this radically new vision of Jesus. We are just so attached to the idea that God loves people who are a lot like us. 
But St. Paul, for one, caught a glimpse of what it could mean when the divisions we construct come crashing down. It's why he could sing with confidence that in Christ there is no Jew or Greek, no slave or free, no male or female. He could say without hesitation that the division between races or sexes or nations have no place in the Christian vocabulary. Except to say that wherever we raise these barriers, God's love, God's desire to bring health and wholeness and life through Christ will break down every wall. And that includes even the barriers we throw up between ourselves and God. That's the other, perhaps more personal, gift this woman of Canaan has for us this morning. She's a woman of faith who did not let anything stand in her way in search for peace for herself and health for her daughter. She trusted that Jesus could do this. She knew she would not get this gift because she deserved it. She knew she didn't deserve it, but she asked for it anyway. And she kept on asking when you or I might have given up. You know that not infrequently when we're hurting, hurting because of our own illnesses or troubles we have ourselves or those we love. Sometimes, I know, we don't even know how to ask God for help. We place our own barriers in the way because we are afraid or we feel that we don't deserve God's attention or healing love. The Canaanite woman can stand as a model of the outside who is glad to take the crumbs who cannot be dissuaded from believing that she is a child of God, the object of God's love. This woman believed Jesus could heal, and he did. Fellow Gentiles, since I expect that's more or less who we all are here this morning, let that Gentile woman be a model of the faith for us. Remembering her faith, we too can trust that we are acceptable to God, that God desires our healing, and as the gospel teaches us, not only our healing, but the healing of the whole world. Thanks be to God. Amen.